Hey, what's going on, y'all? So, this is the second installment of uh, our series on black manhood. Um, and, you know, I think I'm going to start, I'm going to, we're going to do is we're going to have some basic definitions, and then I will get more specific as we go along. So, um, I had said that there were four pillars of, uh, there were four pillars of manhood, and I referred to them as the four Ps. Um, the terminology actually came from uh, Jack Donovan, uh, Way of Man. He had what he called the three Ps, and I just added a fourth P. And um, and my definition differs a little bit from his, so uh, I'll. If you want to know more about that subject, with like the origin of this theory, uh, go to Way of Way of Man. It's a very good book. And uh, of course, like I said, I have my own um, my own ideas, um, which are culturally specific. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, uh, let's start with the first P, which is not the first P in his theory, but to me, it's the first one because it is the most decidedly uh, masculine of the four pillars. Now, remember, uh, just to recap, the pillars are uh, procreate, uh, provide, um, uh, preside, and uh, protect. Um, and really, all four of those roles, women fill. Women can fill, right? Uh, women can provide for families. They can protect their families. They can preside over their families. Uh, they procreate, of course. Um, and in the absence of men, they actually do a pretty good job. Uh, however, the pillar that I consider the most masculine of them all, which is... Um, which is uh, uh, protect, that is a pillar that men is, is very, very masculine. Um, that is something that we are, are, are uh, physiologically built for, that um, it is more natural for men to do. And even in today's modern, you know, gender neutral, e equal society, um, Society, no matter what they say, they still believe that this is a man's job. You know, I mean, you know, women can become cops, women can become security guards, they can become military. Um, uh, but it is not a field, those aren't fields that women in large numbers are drawn to. You know, and even when they are drawn to those fields, they usually avoid the more physical parts of the, those roles. Um, which are, like I said, they're more suited for men. Um, just our physiology makes us more prepared, uh, makes us uh, more suited for that kind of role. And, uh, and it's a little bit more than just protect. So let me explain a little bit. Um, it is incumbent up, up, upon the man to protect his family, protect his woman, protect his community, to... Um, establish boundaries or what they would call a perimeter you establish a perimeter that gives your family and your community a safe zone right uh, in order for the woman to successfully take care of her children she has to know that it's safe to go outside that when she is there's nothing there's no outside forces that are going to interfere with her ability to take care of her children and uh and this is how you raise healthy children and which is um uh i'm gonna get off a little su off subject a little bit but in cases where both the man and the woman are the provider there's nobody dedicated full time to taking care of the children right you send the kids off to school um, when the kids get out of school, there's they're often by themselves for a couple of hours before mom and dad get home. Mom and dad have already been battling eight, nine, ten hours, you know, in, in, in traffic and on the job and with stress and things like that. So what those kids are not getting is they're not getting the full attention of the parents. Neither parent, if, if they're lucky enough to have both parents and both parents are working, they're not getting full attention. They're getting a parent who's at the end of the workday. I just want to eat. 
uh, you know, I'm going to feed the kids and uh, and get ready for the next day, go to bed. You know what I mean? That's basically it. Um, if you do have activities with the kids, it's very, very limited because, again, mom and dad are tired. You know what I'm saying? And so I argue that it is counterproductive to raising healthy children uh, when both parents are working. It's just not... Uh, it's always better for at least one parent to dedicate all their time towards the children. You think about how many field trips those children go go on uh, unaccompanied by their parents. How many activities are going on at the school that that child is looking for mom and dad to walk through the door and mom and dad are not coming. You know what I mean? Um, how many kids call their friends for help with homework because they can't go to mom and dad for help with homework. You know what I mean? How how many conversations is that kid having with someone outside the family compared to conversations with mom and dad? You know, you don't want to accept this. But the truth is your children are spending more time with a teacher and they're under the influence, more of influence, more they're under more influence of their teachers and their friends than they are of you. And uh, I challenge anybody who disagrees with that. When your kids are away from you, that amount of the day, that that uh, that percentage of the day, um, they're not getting parented until the end of the day. And what they're being parented by, as a matter of fact, it's not even parenting. They're getting uh, a tired mom and dad who uh, will probably run them to karate class or music lessons and let's hurry up and eat. And did you guys do your homework? Yeah, okay. They don't even check. Just okay, all right, well... You know, put your books by uh, book bags by the door and go jump in the shower and get ready for bed. That's not parenting. You know what I'm saying? And and um, so anyway, it is the man's job to ensure the environment where a mother could give that child a hundred percent of her attention. And uh, and that is part of what the perimeter is about. So let me explain a little bit about more about the perimeter. Um. In the old days, uh, there were no police, there were no uh, laws and things like that um, protecting communities. And so communities did go to war with each other. Um, they, if you were near an aggressive tribe, you were always under threat uh, that someone or someones could come into your community and disrupt life. You know, uh, take women, take uh, animals, um, cause trouble, you know what I mean, take our resources, um, you know, even fight with us, let's say over water rights or something like that. <clears throat> and, uh, and even today in the modern era, when we have laws and we have cities and things like that, we still have this war going on between communities, especially if you live in America. Um, we have to establish physical boundaries, uh, and then also uh, intellectual boundaries. Everything inside this perimeter is ours. Everything outside this perimeter is theirs. Everyone inside this perimeter is us. Everyone outside the perimeter is them. You understand what I'm saying? And it is important for, even in the modern day, for men to have these boundaries established and you have to take it seriously, right? And so what that means is um, how often do things go on in your community that you don't like and often you didn't know about until they went up? Businesses, liquor stores. God damn, we got another liquor store in a fucking neighborhood. You know, um, some apartment complex decides to start you know, accepting uh, ex-cons or, or um, uh, uh, um, sexual predators, you know, uh, uh, people on the list. I forgot what they, forgot what they call that list. Um, you know, you, you, you go on that uh, website to look up sexual predators and you find out, fuck, I got 50 in my neighborhood. How did this happen without me knowing? Because you did not establish the perimeter. And when Koreans and Vietnamese and Chinese come into your communities and they open businesses that supposedly serve your community and they mistreat the people in the neighborhood, they don't give anything back, 
that is a breakdown of the perimeter. When police come into your community and attack your children, your your teenagers, and uh, things like that, and you don't do shit about it, that is a violation of the perimeter. Because if if this is a true perimeter that I have established, don't shit go on in this community unless I say I say it's okay. Nothing happens here unless I have the approval. And you don't need a city government to do it. You need balls. You need a the cooperation of other like-minded men to do this. Okay? Or like-minded women. You know, you 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 have to have a militia. You have to have an, a military force to be able to set up these these perimeters. You know, to to go against businesses you don't want in the community. To put business owners and even property owners in the neighborhood in check about, you know, Trump goes into a black neighborhood and buys buildings and then he won't he won't rent to black folks or he will rent to black folks, but he won't fit it, fix anything. What are you going to do about that? And this is how men protect their communities. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's not just going out and fighting, you know, uh, uh. Jumping on somebody if they attack my woman and nine times out of ten is I attack your woman. You ain't gonna do shit anyway You know if if um, The Ku Klux Klan should actually be afraid White supremacists should be afraid to come into the black community and do anything We have more guns uh, per capita than probably any community in America Yet white folks don't fear shit Coming in the black community because they know niggas ain't gonna do shit I can come in, do what I want to these black folks, and they won't do a goddamn thing about it. But you know what? Step on my shoe, nigga. I'll, I'll kill you. We will. We are so aggressive with each other, but we're not aggressive with our own enemies. We're quick to make enemies of each other, but we will not make enemies. We will not declare war on our enemies, on our declared enemies. That is a breakdown of the perimeter, and um, and. When you uh, form a perimeter, you are forming a community. You are organizing. You are inviting in services that you would like to have. Well, that's part of providing. But, the, you know, the, one thing about these roles is they do overlap. You know what I'm saying? When, when, uh, when men are protectors, they are more attractive to women. Uh, that's kind of the uh, thing that women say when they, say, when they explain why they like uh, thugs and why they like uh, ex-cons and things like that. Well, I feel like I'm I'm, I'm protected. Uh, it's a little bit of a um, of a uh, it's a little bit twisted. It's a little bit corrupted, but they get the idea. They want a man who's going to protect them. You know what I'm saying? What happened? The problem is quite often knowing how to fight, knowing how to fuck are the only things that we're giving our women and. It's like I said, it's more to the protector role besides punching a dude in the mouth when he's looking at your woman's ass. It's more than that. Okay. It is uh, having a battle plan. It is having an army. If if something was to go down in my house, matter of fact, here, if something was to go down here, I have at least 15 brothers in this community I can go to and say, hey, man, come to my house. And matter of fact. Those of you who knew me from Sacramento and knew me from Washington, D.C., you also know I've always had that. My house got broken into twice and my business was broken into once. I had brothers there within minutes. I uh, went to a friend's um, funeral. I mean, a funeral. I went to a friend's wedding and uh, got jumped um, by my ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend and his weak-ass homeboys. Um, and by the way, I won that fight, but within 30 minutes, I had three of my homeboys there ready to fight again. You know what I'm saying? Um, you have to have a circle that you can call on, uh, when things go down and it is important for men in a community to have identified because not all men, not all men have it in them to be protectors, right? So, um, and, you know, I'm not going to knock those brothers. Uh, but in days of old, when you are a man that cannot protect your woman, they called you a coward. They they um, they shame, you know, they shamed you. Um, they ostracized you. 
you were you were seen as a punk basically you were not seen as a as a real man a men had to know how to fight matter of fact here in this little community i live in this little town all men know how to fight that's something very very basic uh you know there's a stereotype about asians they all know how to do martial arts and if you came here, you'd probably laugh because most men here do know martial arts. <laughs> um, I'll tell you a little bit about this community. It's called Hala Hala. And uh, there, this was one of the bloodiest battles for the Japanese when they tried to take over the Philippines. Well, actually, they did take over the Philippines, part of it. But this was one of the bloodiest battles. I think 15,000 Japanese lost their lives here. And uh, it may have been maybe 4,000 Filipinos lost their lives. And they were armed with weapons and, oh, well, firearms. And the Filipinos just came with uh, sticks, spears, and, and blades. And uh, it was a slaughter. The, the Japanese withdrew. They went right across this water that's out here. and went into Batangas and, and uh, ran away. Uh, it's called the Battle of Hala Hala. J-A-L-A, J-A-L-A. Look it up. Uh, my grandfather was a gorilla that participated in that. So this community and the next community, which is Payete, uh, Laguna, are known for their martial arts. Uh, there's a popular martial art called um, Sikaran that's founded in the next community. Uh, and, uh, and then they have uh, stick fighting festivals all over the place. So it's really part of the, the, the culture here. Uh, but the bottom line is that um, the men here have that protective role kind of built into the local culture. And we do have that in in the black community in America. The problem is uh, it's kind of been stifled. You know what I mean? Uh, black folks do not fight. We do carry firearms. Uh, I don't know about half the brothers, but a good, uh, a good percentage of the black community owns a firearm and can protect but the problem is that we often don't protect. And men who do not know how to take care of their woman and don't even try to protect their woman uh, would be justifiably shamed. Because to me, if you, one of the most basic things you do besides fucking your woman and feeding your family is protecting your woman. So if another person can hurt her or threaten her, and you don't do shit about it either because maybe you're scared or or uh, worried about the, the repercussions of doing it, then yeah, you are a punk. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, you know, I often say this, the reason why that black cop, you know, cops beat people up all the time, they shoot people all the time, but black cops don't do that shit to white folks because they know they ain't gonna get it. They know white people ain't gonna stand for that shit. White cops do that shit to black folks because they know we won't do a damn thing about it. That has to change. And uh, I keep saying this, but police brutality will continue in America until black people, until black folks make these white boys pay for that shit. You know, they don't necessarily have to do it right there on the spot. You know, a little protest, they don't do shit. But if that motherfucker is giving back his badge and, and set back loose in the community, and you let that nigga live? Oh, shit. No wonder we getting killed. We don't deserve respect. And I will say that on this, my, my fucking channel, my video, my opinion. But if you allow someone to harm your loved ones and those in your community, and you don't do anything about it, you don't deserve respect. And uh, just as I say in the alchemy uh, videos that life doesn't give us what we are due it doesn't give us what we need or what we want life gives us what we deserve and if you want respect you must earn respect and uh, a weak way of putting it is you show respect to get respect that's not how you that's not how you get respect you get respect by showing by proving that there are repercussions to not respecting it is better to be feared than to be loved. And the problem is black folks is trying to be loved. Okay. And uh, and that is a major, major problem. Our, our psychology, our philosophy is all fucked up. So in setting up this perimeter, the black community has to identify who is in, 
in with us, which may include Mexicans and Asians and white folks. But when you are a guest in my house, you better act right. You see what I'm saying? Uh, on on um, uh, in my martial arts school, for example, uh, that kind of operates like my own community. Um, I don't have very many white students, but the few white students I have know that uh, they better not be on that make America great bullshit or that Trump bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Because I will not teach you. Matter, matter of fact, um, uh, well, let, me, let me not go there. But if you're going to be in our circle, you understand the rules of the house and you will act accordingly. And black folks need to do that with our communities. I don't mind if a Korean comes and opens a business in my community. I don't mind if a Chinese guy comes and puts a restaurant, a grocery store, whatever, in my community. But there's a certain way you better behave when you're in this community or we will shut you down. And because the black man fails to do it, because he fails to... Um, uh, uh, um, demand uh, he fails to establish boundaries he fails to um, establish rules that must be followed when you're in his community that allows people to just come in and act like an occupying force including these Asian business owners who come into the black community to make money off of us and not give respect in return you know not not uh, do anything for the community. Um, I'm an Orthodox Muslim, but I respect, and this is going to sound fucked up if you're Muslim. I'm an Orthodox Muslim, but I respect the nation of Islam a hundred times more than I respect Muslims. Uh, the only thing we have is the same faith. That's it. That it, for me and indigenous, well, not indigenous Muslim. For me and those who follow al-Islam, I have very little in common with you because you don't give a damn about the black community and may, very often those of us who are black Muslims don't love black people enough. We love them damn Arabs and Pakistanis more than we love black people. I don't care if you're atheist. I don't care if you're Christian. I don't care if you're one of these fucking Israelite motherfuckers. If you are black, you are my brother. And uh, for a lot of folks, well, you know, he ain't dean and so fuck him. That is a very, very weak. Because, you know, I, I tell you what, even as a Muslim, when you go down into the masjid, they still see a nigger. And it's even worse because nine times out of ten, you weren't born Muslim. So now you're even lower on the totem pole. Use a Negro and you're a convert. But the nation loved the black community and they established those parameters. They established the perimeter. They established boundaries. They put rules. If you're going to be in this community, this is what you will do. This is how you will act. You understand? And uh, back in the, I think it was in, well, I was, I was actually deployed at that time. So it was like 2003. Um, when the news came out that the black, the black Muslims in Oakland were going into uh, liquor stores, uh, and many of them were Muslim-owned liquor stores, which is like, like I said, that's why I ain't got love for these motherfuckers. Coming into liquor stores and and uh, shutting them down, vandalizing, whooping motherfuckers' ass, knocking bottles off the the shelves because this stuff is poisoning my people. You have to have some. You have to have some control of your community, and you have to be able to police your own communities. So anyway, uh, I'm, I'm rambling right now. So um, uh, there will probably be a part two to the protector role. But keep in mind that the main thing about, about the protector role is we have to establish perimeters. I have to um, give my woman and give the women in my community, the families in my community, even the men, for example, there are old men who can't fight. There are uh, disabled men. There are men who just aren't built for fighting. It is on those of us who can to protect those brothers as well. Because keep in mind, one day you're going to be an old brother. You're going to be an old man who's going to be in need of protection. 
And as long as you protect the generation before you, when they grow up, they will learn from your example and they will protect you when you become old and feeble. Okay, so um, there are uh, many parts to the protector role. And uh, we'll explore those in another video, maybe a part two or something like that. But uh, keep in mind the uh, establishing community uh, involved is part of the protector role, establishing the perimeter and identifying who is with us, who is part of this community, who is not. And those who are not in this community, they need to watch themselves when they come to our community. And if they do something that is harmful to my community, I have to be willing to make that person pay consequences. And, you know, one of the, the things that, that um, testosterone does for a man, uh, besides physically making us strong, it also helps us develop courage and bravery. Um, we lose the fear of what might happen to us if something happens. For example, my daughter, when she was uh, six years old, or kindergarten, no, no, she was six years old. When she was six years old, she was being, a little girl tried to bully her because she was wearing hijab. And my daughter is not a pushover. She is a, a daddy's princess. And at school, she forgets that I'm not at home. So when the little girls make fun of her or try to push her around, she pushes back. So uh, my daughter did strike another child who tried to yank her hijab off, as I taught her. Uh, anyway, puts her hands on you, you make them pay for it. And, uh, and I taught my son that if you see your sister being attacked by anybody, male or female, you whoop that ass. And he was six years old. No, he was seven. Seven years old. So as a result, I got called in, and I wouldn't even address what my kids did to the little girl. What I wanted to do, I wanted to talk to the little girl's daddy because uh, I need an apology and reassurance from you that you're going to teach your child how to treat my child because I've instructed my child to hurt anybody who harms one of those two. Um, it got ugly. The brother showed up. He's a tall dude, looked at me, you know, uh, tried to play me. And uh, I don't look ghetto, but I am very ghetto. And so I was willing to take that dude outside and beat the fuck out of him. And uh, our principal, Mr. Pagano, oh, excuse me, our principal uh, had to involve the police. But I guarantee one thing that motherfucker got home and talked to his child. And because the next day I got an apology, uh, I did not worry about what were the repercussions when the, we're talking about my children. I will uh, let me not go there. I don't want to turn you guys into enemies before you get a chance to know me. <laughs> so if somebody har harms my child, I'll I will tear this whole motherfucker down. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, but in the process of protecting your children, uh, you should be willing to do anything and suffer any consequences in order to protect your children, and protect your woman. Um, and you have to choose men to work alongside you who are made, who are cut from the same cloth. So I have to choose my um, men at arms. You know what I mean? I have to choose my comrades. I have to choose the people who will stand beside me when the shit breaks out. Uh, my uh, my sister-in-law follows this channel. So I don't know if, well, a former sister-in-law follows this channel. So I don't know if she's going to see this. But in our 20s, um, my brother was working out of town on a construction contract. And a guy called my sister-in-law a bitch. And uh, I had to go down to the restaurant where she worked and uh, uh, straighten this dude out. Um, I have no problem doing that and, uh, and I did do it and I did not care about the repercussions, but I guarantee that motherfucker never, never was going to disrespect her again. And he did not. He spent the rest of the time working there trying to make up to her because he knew what type of family she was connected to. I think what happened was he had probably seen my brother and saw that he's a tall, skinny, pretty boy and figured, okay, well, I can treat her any way I want. And um, and the thing is, I'm glad it was me and not my brother, because my brother is probably 
more reckless than I am. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We just don't look like we cut from that cloth. Um, but my brother knows that anytime, and, and several times he has called me. My other brother has uh, called me before when he's had trouble. Uh, my sister's called me when she had trouble. Um, I don't care if you're male or female, old or young. Uh, when I'm protecting mine, I'm like a dog with her puppies. I'm like a lion with her cubs. You know what I'm saying? And men have to be the same way about your families. And one of the reasons why violence visits or, or mistreatment visits the black community so much is because the men in the community are not made from that. You know what I'm saying? We have to bring that back because when we don't, we are failing the women of our community. Um, I saw a video recently on uh, YouTube of a guy, uh, put, he, it was a white guy, he pushed a black woman, an older black woman, uh, and I think we were in a, in a grocery store or a, a pharmacy, um, drugstore or something like that, and so proud of these brothers, three brothers jumped on a dude and beat dog shit out of him, to the point that the sister was like, please brothers, no, that's enough, that's enough. That is how you handle business. Because I guarantee you, everyone who saw that shit uh, will probably never fuck with a black woman again. Especially that black woman. You know what I'm saying? We, we have to bring that back. We cannot fail to protect the women in our community, to protect the children in our community, to protect our interests. Right? So it's not always about fighting. Sometimes it's that... Uh, sometimes we just have to protect uh, our resources. There are people coming into the black community to take resources right out from under the black folks. And black black men, black well, black women too, I mean, they could do it, but it's really more on the black man to do it. We have to put up a defense. So when they sit and talk about, um, they're talking about gentrification and things like that, that is the point that black folks should be buying up real estate. You can't complain about white boys coming in, buying up real estate when you failed to do it. When that community was run down and, and uh, drug infested, we should have fixed all that. So we can't really get mad at the white boy from coming in and doing this shit because that was our responsibility. There should have been no drugs in a black community with all those black men around. Don't you have wives? Don't you have children? Let me tell you what they did in River Terrace. Those of you who from the D.C. area, we used to burn crack houses. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. When there was a drug house in the community, and we've had them in River Terrace, where actually was my grandfather, my paternal grandfather's neighborhood. Um, they would do things like cut off the electricity, tear the doors out, run the drug addicts out of there. And when the drug addicts would not stop going back in that house, they would set that motherfucker on fire. And we have to be those kinds of men. This is our community. This is where we live. Is this what you want? Do you think that white boy is going to allow niggas to come into his neighborhood and sell drugs right next door to him? Hell no. And, and we, like I said, you can't get mad at white folks for taking advantage of our ignorance. There are enemies. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, of course, I mean, not all white folks, but historically, they are your enemies. So you can't blame an enemy for doing enemy shit. But what you can, what you do have to blame is ourselves for allowing it. So we have to protect our own communities. We have to establish boundaries. We have to protect our resources. And we also have to impede on other people's resources we open a black business why do it only in a black community why not go over to the white community the mexican community make some money off of them and bring their dollars into our community you see what i'm saying so anyway like i said these things do overlap but anyway i have pretty much um there are other things i want to talk about but I, it's going to take probably another 20 30 minutes for me to talk about it so i'm going to end this now and then but i do want to talk about the other three pillars so that will be the next video so probably tomorrow I'll, uh, I'll record it. So, um, but this one pillar is decidedly uh, masculine. It is most certainly the man's role. And the other ones, 
um, you know, uh, women can do those too. But this is the most masculine of the uh, uh, four pillars, which is why I, I introduced it first. All right, you guys, have a good day. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please subscribe, hit the bell button so you get notifications. All right, peace.